Thank you for joining us, everyone. We are excited to share analytics career advice with you today. Um, my name is Katie Prezis. I'm the Director of Research and Operations here at Birchworks. Um, and before I hand things off to our speakers, I want to quickly share some logistics for today's session. First, only our presenters will be able to speak, so your phone lines and microphones are muted. Um, but please do not be shy. We will have plenty of time today to take your questions. So simply send them my way via the chat function on the left side of your screen, um, and I will collect those uh, throughout the talk and uh, pitch them to Linda and Katie Ferguson a little later. While we anticipate having a seamless event, if you experience any technical issues, you can also send us through the chat as well. I'll do my best to help you with those. And today's session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel very soon. I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers, whom I'm sure many of you already know and maybe have spoken with recently. First, uh, Linda Birch, who is Birchworks Managing Director. Linda has been recruiting in analytics for over 30 years and holds a degree in industrial engineering and operations research in addition to an MBA. She started her career on the corporate side with Pepsi and Whirlpool before landing in executive recruiting. Katie Ferguson is a partner and early career recruiting specialist at Birchworks. She works with mid and junior level analytics professionals as they start their careers. Before coming to Birchworks, she graduated with a master's degree in human resource development and set spent six years as a recruiter and human resource generalist for the City of Chicago. Birchworks has been repeatedly mentioned in the popular press, which I'm sure many of you already know, um, regarding analytics market trends in publications such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, CNBC, Mashable, and many more. Both Linda and Katie are actively involved in the analytics community and presented this talk to a sold out crowd as the capstone presentation for the Chicago chapter of the American Statistical Association's 2016 luncheon series. Linda, I'll let you take things from here. Well, that was very nice, Katie. Thank you so much, and thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, it's, uh, it's my pleasure and Katie's pleasure, Katie uh, Ferguson's pleasure, I'm sure, uh, to sort of re-give this talk. Um, we, um, we did this back in May, uh, and when I originally proposed the title to the luncheon coordinator, Adam McKelleny. I'm not sure he was that crazy about it, but, uh, uh, but you all must have liked it since you're here today. Thank you for joining us. Um, we've been, we were having a really nice turnout. So as uh, Katie mentioned, uh, save your questions to the end, and Katie Ferguson and I will do our very best to field them. Actually, it's, it's, part of, uh, it's, it's usually the favorite part of a presentation like this, for me at least. So Now, many of you probably remember the movie Revenge of the Nerds. It was a classic tale of um, a bunch of guys that were kind of awkward, a little bit quirky, uh, and, and they were definitely intellects, uh, and they were constantly being harassed on campus by the football jocks. Um, it came out back in the 1980s, but it's kind of blossomed into a movie with a bit of a cult following, um, and I'm thinking it may have been the turning point in a very positive direction for the image of uh, nerdiness overall. So pop culture now pretty much embraces nerds. Uh, but I have to say that I suspect that most of that has to do with the fact that nerds are now earning very large paychecks. So, so anyway, I borrowed the movie title and I switched it up a bit to uh, fit today's talk. Now, Steve Case, who is the founder of AOL, came out with a book in April uh, called The Third Wave. Many of you may have read it. Uh, but I, I thought it did a really great job of tracing the path of Internet development. The first wave was laying the foundation for the Internet. Uh, it, was a, it was very time consuming. It was risky, difficult, and expensive. So lots of companies came and went during that time period. Uh, some of the companies that we know, um, that we all know very well, like AOL and Microsoft, IBM and Yahoo, they they were all part uh, played a big part in this uh, initial wave. So then the second wave um, came across, and that is uh, social networking development, and along with e-commerce. And innovation during this time went much more quickly. So companies like Facebook, Twitter, Google, YouTube, and on and on. So um, now I don't know if many of you know this, but 2007 was a banner year. Um, Apple launched the iPhone. Facebook opened up to everyone, not just uh, students. Google released Android. 
Hadoop launched uh, in 2007. Also, Twitter launched as its own platform. Uh, Amazon came out with Kindle. Airbnb launched. Um, and all of this happened in one year, 2007. So um, lots of our millennial um, contacts will call this kind of the back in the day period. Um, <laughs> but really, it was less than 10 years ago. So all of a sudden, everything started to become digitized. Um, and that in turn kind of helped to kick off the big data tidal wave of sorts. And then in uh, Steve's case's uh, third wave, which has already gotten started, um, it has Internet-enabled devices kind of spreading into our everyday lives. So in this case I'm talking about the Internet of Things, or maybe you could call it the Internet of Everything. Um, this is going to be more of a challenging time. Um, and it's going to be more time consuming, it's going to be expensive, and there's uh, going to be failures. So there's not going to be any overnight successes. Um, well, I don't know, I shouldn't say any, but there's going to be very few overnight successes. Um, also, partnerships will need to be formed, and regulations are going to pop up to uh, slow things down. So Uber is a great example of a third wave company. Uh, it's run into, as you all know, uh, a lot of resistance from unions and city regulators. So it's slowing the whole pro their success down a bit. Um, but it's going to succeed because it really has a strong appeal for the consumer. Um, but it's going to, you know, it's going to take much longer than it normally might have. Another example is personalized education. Uh, it's a great idea. Uh, that's going to take a lot of attempts, uh, different kinds of attempts by different people, um, and maybe uh, a couple more decades be before it comes mainstream. But it is coming. So numbers now are everywhere, and quants like Nate Silver have reached rock star status pretty much. Um, there's tech leaders like Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates, who's now, of course, pretty much a household name. You know, all this is to say that you've picked the right career. Uh, data is now everywhere, and you are at the top of the heap. So um, if you, it, uh, let's put it another way, um, if you're ready to take the, uh, that you're ready to take the Iron Throne. Uh, but if any of you are watching Game of Thrones, uh, you know well that if you're at the top, everybody's going to be gunning for you. So this is uh, so. So it's really important that I think you take away from today's talk. Watch out because things will change. They always do. Corporate jargon doesn't it just about drive you nuts? Um, but the one that we all need to pay the most attention to, any of us, is uh, and and it's the biggest threat to our career futures is disruption. You know, there's lots of examples of this in our everyday work world. Um, Hadoop, uh, I think maybe two, maybe three years ago now, has been called passe uh, by Google. Uh, it's now all about Spark. And then, of course, there's the R versus Python versus SAS. Um, open source software is running over uh, the more traditional um, tools that, that many of us have used for decades. Um, many of you probably uh, participated in our recent uh, flash survey, SAS versus R versus Python. Um, the re results are very interesting, and I would encourage you to visit our blog to see those details. Um, and we also did a real quick 15-minute webinar discussing the results, so very interesting this year. So as many of you know, all these new analytics groups are being formed, and they're quickly changing how corporations are managed as they become much more data-driven. And in short, pretty much everybody is talking about um, data-driven decision-making, and I, I want you all to capitalize on this movement. But in order to do that, um, it's important to be strategic about how you manage your career. So uh, how exactly do you navigate these tricky waters? Well, that's what Katie and I are hopefully going to equip you with today. So what are we going to talk about? We'll, we'll start, start uh, with early, early career planning. Uh, and then we're going to talk of, uh, about mid-career planning. Katie's going to cover uh, both of those topics. 
Uh, and then head honcho planning because it is never too early to start thinking about things. So um, that's my philosophy. So um, we'll go over some demographic and salary trends uh, from our, uh, our last uh, Birchworks study. Um, and then we'll look at demographics also. And then we'll cover, cover some of the very common mistakes that people make when planning their careers. And then we're going to close with a little bit of advice. Um, after that, we'll get into a question and answer session. So right now, I am going to turn things over to Katie Ferguson, who is our expert on early careers for quantitative professionals. Not only does Katie know about career planning, she also helps younger professionals with advice on almost everything, including how to dress, what sorts of questions are appropriate, and then, of course, compensation advice, even how to write thank you notes. So, and don't laugh. That is really important. So anyway, um, on to you, Katie. Thanks, Linda, for that nice um, opening and and uh, into early career planning. Yes, I do um, work with candidates, um, usually in their beginning to mid, mid stages of, of their career, and we cover everything. Um, and it's important too. So if you, you know, that's what I'm here for. Um, so of course, um, most young people coming out of a master's degree or PhD program, or let me, let me rephrase a second, while they're in school, um, need to plan appropriately and need to target um, internships. I cannot stress enough how important they are. In fact, I recently did an entire blog piece on this subject. I find that entry-level candidates with real project or internship experience, overall their resume stands out, they interview better, and they have a better business acumen. Tools. SAS, SQL, R, Tableau, Spark, Hadoop, Hive, Python, the list goes on and on. Stay on top of trends and have a wide variety of tools in your toolkit. Now Linda's going to laugh at me. She always does with this. But if your program, for example, if your program uses R, then try to take a SAS class. Um, companies are still using both as the primary tool. So make sure you have both in your toolkit early on in your career. Um, many companies are um, approaching us and telling us that Tableau is a nice to have. So if you haven't had exposure to it, take a class. It's an easy class to get some exposure on. It's easy to learn on your own. I would recommend doing that as well. So just a couple, couple points on, on tools. Right, and, and, and her point is more is better, and that's absolutely true. So um, I definitely pay attention to that, uh, especially early on. Scope of work. Now this is important throughout your career, but early on make sure you really evaluate the day-to-day -day work. It is very hard at this level to fix and course correct if you kind of make a bad mistake or don't take the ideal job that you wanted when it comes to the actual work. Um, kind of taking a misstep could be not the, not the best move here at this point. So just make sure you're evaluating um, and asking questions, especially to the other maybe analysts that you'd be working with and your manager. Walk away from that interview knowing what the job encompasses. Right. And I, and I think one of the things that um, you know, when, when you ask, hiring managers what's the most important thing uh, that they're looking for in a quantitative candidate. And uh, you know, what always pops to the top of the list is a sense of curiosity. So, um, and you show curiosity through asking questions. So it's very important um, not only for you to understand what you're getting into, um, but it also shows that you're curious about the work that they do and how they do it and what's important to them and what are their pain points, all that stuff. Um, it just you know don't don't have this list of questions, but think about it before you go into your interview, um, and really engage in conversation. It should be a back and forth discussion. It should not be this you know they ask you a question, you answer it. They ask you another question, you answer it. It's got to be a dialogue. And visas. Candidates that require visa sponsorship, if you're on an F1 or OPT at the current moment. I would just recommend that you're asking questions early and often. 
Um, if you are on an OPT, does the company sponsor visas? Are they E-verified? These are all things you should be finding out at the beginning stages and not waiting until the end um, to discover that they possibly aren't able to sponsor a visa. And then if you are lucky enough to land the job and you start, make sure you ask um, if they'll file for your H-1B in the first cycle in April. Um, I've had a few candidates tell me that they've bumped into that throughout, the, throughout their process. So just ask that again early and often. Yes, visas is something that Katie is an expert at. She could be an immigration lawyer. <laughs> Mid-career planning. If you take one tip away from this webinar today, always remain hands-on. Never get too far away from the data. You should always be able to roll up your sleeves and dig in the data at any level, whether you are an analyst or the head of analytics. So many jobs today have a player-coach dynamic. You need to understand the analysis to mentor, to present, and to stay current. So remain hands-on. You know, it's, it's so interesting because you know, and I, I do most of my recruiting at the senior levels at this point, and I've found time and time again that the best candidates are the ones that always, you know, they sort of sheepishly tell me, you know, on the weekends, you know, I just like to get my hands on some data just because it's just fun for me. <laughs> so uh, again, it's, it's part of that whole curiosity package of, of, uh, of really wanting to, uh, somebody who really wants to stay involved with uh, the whys and the hows of things and the, and, and the detail. And again, you can't always do that, um, but don't get too far away from it, as Katie pointed out. It's a great, uh, uh, it's a, it's a great lifelong skill. Changing industries. We recommend that you change industries kind of early and middle, during your early and middle career, change jobs or industries, let me rephrase that, every two to three years. This is the time to do it, especially from a learning perspective, because you will have a company that will be willing to take the chance on you to switch industries and learn. Once you break, into that mid-career senior level, and you're making, you know, over you're making into the six figures over over a hundred thousand. Companies expect a certain level of expertise, and it will be much harder for you to change industries. Titles. Don't get hung up on titles. An analyst in one organization is a manager in a similar organization. <laughs> so HR, re HR, recruiters, and other analytics professionals are aware of this. When you are looking to change jobs and are questioning the title, I would evaluate the scope of work, look at the responsibilities, look at the overall culture of the company, and look at the career progression. Evaluate the entire opportunity. Don't get hung up on the title. Should I manage? That is up to you. That's what's great about analytics is you, you have the choice. It's not for everyone. I would recommend that kind of at early to mid-career, once you have a, a few years under your belt, that you begin by mentoring someone maybe on a project or a client, and see how that goes, and evaluate the situation and take it from there. That's something that Linda and I can advise you on as well. But again, it's not for everyone. Right, and, and it's so interesting. It's, it's one of those, be careful what you wish for. Um, a lot of people aspire to manage because they think that that's what they need to do in order to climb a career ladder. And, and you know, by and large, that is true. However, you have to be really true to yourself. And that, if that's not a skill set that you feel passionate about, which is you know, a lot of that is just mentoring others and, uh, and, and guiding and leading and representing the organization, going to a lot of meetings, all that kind of stuff, you, know, you may not want to do it. And if you don't, oftentimes you really need to make sure that you, can, that you have a, a path within the organization where you can continue to learn um, and grow as an individual contributor. Geographical constraints and relocation. Well, obviously the more um, open you are from a geographical um, perspective, the more options you'll have. Make moves geographically 
early and middle career while you can, especially from a personal standpoint. Um, you, if you decide to make a big change and move across country, please, please, please consult your significant other and your children, especially if they are teenagers. You, will have, you may have some resistance. So I would talk about that with them early in the process or actually even before you submit a resume. Make sure that everyone is on board with, for this change. And working remote, we are seeing this more and more um, nowadays. And companies are starting to um, be more receptive to it, especially if someone needs to, to move. Maybe they had been with the company and need to move. Um, my, actually, my colleague Sandy Marmot just did an, a great piece on this. So check that out on our website too. It's a, it's a little bit more in detail. Um, there are certainly pros and cons to working remotely. Um, I would say from a visibility standpoint, working remote is probably not the best for you at a, at a mid-career level. Um, you, you just aren't – you're not visible. You're not there. You're not walking away from the meeting and everyone's hanging out in the kitchen or the water cooler talking about the meeting. Um, what else, Linda? What are some other things that – you know, one of the things that I think is so important is developing relationships um, and, and your ability to do that, and especially once you get to the senior level point, is can make or break your success in an organization. So your ability to be visible, to have those casual conversations, to develop those relationships will help you down the road when you're trying to affect change within the organization. You're building those, um, you know, those relationship bridges. Very, very important. You can't do that remotely, or it's extremely difficult. And last, visas. Be aware of green card timing, what's happening, and make sure you're telling your recruiter and the HR person up front the status that you're at. Many companies have a policy where they won't take over your green card for at least a year. Um, I've had many candidates come to me and they um, don't have much time left on their H-1B and they're trying to make a quick change and that can present obstacles. So just always be aware of timing and be upfront with um, the folks that will be involved in the visa process to keep them aware of what's happening. And now I'm going to switch it over to Linda to talk about head honcho planning. So let's say you've made it. Maybe you're at the director level, the senior director level, VP, SVP, head of analytics, CAO, something like that. Um, or maybe let's say you're interviewing for the top job. So let's cover some of the tips. You know, I just had to throw this slide in. Whoops, let's go back. Yeah. Um, Many of you have probably heard this before and attributed it to Bill Gates, but actually um, this is from a guy by the name of, and his name is Charles Sykes. And he's author of a book called Dumbing Down Our Kids. So I just had to throw it in because I think it's so appropriate. So there are tons of different titles uh, and I've, I've seen for top jobs, and these are just a couple of those. Um, and, and you know, at this point, you might even aspire to be the CEO. Um, and, and you know, I'll tell you, I really feel that very soon, quants are going to be running most organizations. So, uh, being a CEO, while 10 or 20 years ago wasn't something that uh, many people thought was in, the, in their future, um, now I think it very much is in play. So. I was talking to one of my clients at Electronic Arts earlier this year. His name is uh, Zach Anderson, um, and he has the top quant job there. So for all of you gamers in the crowd, how fun would that be? So he was telling me um, that early in his career as a quantitative person, he always thought that he was going to have to figure out a way to transition out of analytics if he wanted to continue to climb the career ladder. Um, so he was really blown away um, earlier this year when he was at an executive committee meeting, and the leaders there kind of estimated that about 10% of the total organization in the not-too-distant future was going to be analytics-focused people. So clearly uh, the opportunity for Zach to continue to climb in the organization is there. So 
it's never been a better time to be in analytics. So I'm really um, sort of proud that, that uh, this is all going in that direction. So, so let's talk about um, the kinds of questions that you should ask. Um, if let's say you get a call on a, uh, a head job, maybe from somebody like me. Um, so a new analytics group is forming. You know, and I hear this over and over again um, from organizations that call me where they want, to, you know, to, it's, let's say it's a, it's a large organization that's never really had anything sophisticated when it comes to um, analytics. So, so let's talk about those questions. First and foremost, evaluate the condition of the data. Um, and, and that's very important. What's the infrastructure look like? Um, what you don't want to do is spend two years uh, battling it out uh, with um, the IT group and wrangling data and get everything in, in organized um, before you can do um, the first model. Um, so hopefully a lot of that's already been done. Um, but, but definitely ask a lot of questions around that. So. Uh, also, it's very important to understand who's the internal champion uh, in the organization. Is it coming from the top? Is it board directed? Where's, who's, who's asking for this? Um, and uh, at what level are they? What's the buy-in with the rest of the uh, C-level um, and SVP level uh, players in the organization? Um, also, what's the budget? Do they know how much this is going to cost? Uh, Headcount is very expensive for quantitative people. They're hard to come by, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Also, the tools that you need, even though a lot of it is open source at this point, um, there's still a lot of infrastructure changes that need to happen. So make sure that there's a realistic understanding of what this kind of thing is going to cost. And then time frame to results. Um, if you're, you know, if all they've done in the past, and this is, again, this is something I, I see all the time with the senior level jobs I work on, is they have uh, a lot of BI tools. So they've done, done reporting for years and years. Everybody thought that was good enough. And so they never really got into pre uh, any, anything predictive or let alone prescriptive. Um, so one of the things that you need to make sure is they have a realistic time frame on, on how, is, how long it's going to take to show results. So there may be actually you know, two or three or four different things that you could uh, kick off pretty quickly, a lot of low-hanging fruit. So in the first six months, you could maybe um, you know, show some pretty drastic results pretty easily. Uh, but then things are going to be coming um, a little bit more slowly. So you need to make sure that, they, that everybody kind of understands how long this kind of thing takes. Also, be sure to evaluate the challenge to operationalize. So meaning, again, that's, you know, all, that all comes into play with all the other things, mainly who's the internal champion of this, of this, uh, uh, of this effort. So, uh, because what you're going to need to do is um, be able to develop those relationships across the organization and make sure, um, and, and be the champion for the use of data across the organization. And people are going to have to trust you um, and know that what you're trying to do is give them tools so they can be smarter and better about how they uh, do their job. And, and you know, it's not easy to do. So um, many, many a leader will be evaluated very closely on how they're able to uh, operationalize the use of, of, uh, of analytics. Um, so you really need to evaluate how hard is that going to be given the personalities involved. So you're also likely going to have to build a team. So uh, nobody can do, do all of this on their own. So you know, sometimes the team is only three people. Sometimes it's going to be 25. Um, so it's going to be um, very important for you to be able to reach out to your network. So evaluate how difficult it's going to be. Um, you know, if you're in a remote city uh, and you need to find a uh, data scientist, it's going to be quite a challenge. So again. Set expectations appropriately, figure out alternatives, and then go from there. Be sure you evaluate the total compensation package when uh, you get to the point where you ha you're evaluating an offer or two. Um, equity is part of it, and, and oftentimes it's a big part of it. I've seen a lot of senior level people take laterals or even a reduction in their base salary uh, in order to um, uh, uh, hopefully down the road, re reap the benefits of a, um, an equity payout. 
so again, it, it, it becomes much more important to look, see, look at and evaluate the entire compensation package. And then, of course, stay in tune. Not only stay in tune with the uh, goings on within your organization, um, but also your industry, and then even broader than that, beyond your industry and general trends. So uh, again, it's, it's about lifelong learning. Um, and it's important that you as a leader within the organization uh, to do that not only for the company and your people, but also for yourself and your own career. Okay, back to Katie. Sorry, I think we had some technical difficulty. Let me go back. Sorry, guys. Okay. All right, so I want to do a quick snapshot on just some basics on um, – this is Katie again – on <laughs> predictive analytics because it's important that we discuss that while working on salaries. Okay, so PAPS as we like to call them are highly educated. More than 85% of them have at least a master's degree, if not a PhD. We've seen a surge in analytics programs growing in the last few years, so certainly gaining lots of momentum. Here's another way we kind of slice and dice the data. Um, so many young people are entering programs that we've seen um, a shift in years of experience by an entire year over the last year. No surprise here. I hate to say it, no surprise here. There is still a large difference in men versus women in predictive analytics. And this figure has remained steady for about the last three years. I think maybe one year females were at 26%, but um, hopefully we'll see a change you know, as years progress here. This chart shows analytics professionals um, as they advance in their career, um, up to managers at level 3, about 90% are male. So what's going on with salaries? Well, good news for all you predictive analytics folks. They are going up, up, up. And we saw that at, um, as you can see here, I see 3 getting the most momentum at about 9%. And here's what it looks like for managers. And we will have this available, by the way. Switching gears to, to data scientists, we're seeing the largest increase at about 7% with IC1. And then data science managers have had mixed results, generally pointing to leveling off here. I get this question all the time. Where do most predictive analytics folks work? <laughs> Simple question. Um, based on our data, 33% of them work in financial services. And then about another 25% are employed by data providers or, specialized, um, or marketing services firms you know, like a Nielsen or an IRI. And then salaries do vary by industry with financial services and tech you know, being top. Here's a snapshot from coast to coast. This is level 1, um, what people can 
you know, look at when it comes to salaries. It's not as much of a difference as people often think and when they tell me. Um, and this trend holds true for all level jobs. And then of course you can find all of this information on our website. You can download it. It's a treasure trove of information and goes into much greater detail. But just wanted to give you a quick snapshot today for our call. And then I'm going to switch it over back to Linda for her to talk about mistakes that people make. Thanks, Katie. So after three decades in analytics recruiting and uh, working with thousands and thousands of professionals, I've seen a mistake or two. So let's talk about some of those. Um, first of all, and, and a lot of it goes back to some of the stuff that Katie's already talking about, um, limit, limited targeted companies. So let's say you want to stay in a particular industry or uh, you're having so much fun at your, your company, you're like, why should I ever leave? Um, and, and you know that might be good for short term um, and short term thinking, uh, but you never know five years, ten years, fifteen years down the road whether or not your in, your particular industry or your company might be a um, a target of disruption. So you need to be very careful about uh, sort of dedicating your career to one particular company or one particular industry. So overly narrow geographic constraints, something Katie talked about. Um, if you can move geographically, definitely do that. There's lots of benefits, not only by changing organizations, but also um, seeing a whole new way of uh, how people are looking at analytics and uh, expanding your personal network too. Unrealistic salary expectations is something that every now and then I run into with uh, with candidates where they, they have this expectation that a company is going to sort of chase after them with um, you know, a bucket full of money. And that's, that's just unrealistic. It's, uh, they won't go outside uh, the salary bands. If there's a salary band issue with a client that I'm working with, I have that discussion before we even get to talking to candidates. So it's something that is um, it's just not, not going to happen. So you, you, know, you, should, you, you need to make sure that you're expectations are in line. Uh, and this kind of goes hand in hand with that. Don't take an offer based solely on, stra on, on salary. There's so many other things, so many other factors that are much more important and going to uh, have a big impact on your overall, your long-term career, and actually how successful you are. Um, and that's you know, cultural, uh, cultural, um, cultural fit, uh, opportunities for advancement, uh, expanding what you know, um, what kind of tools are you going, what kind of new tools are you going to be able to be exposed to and use, and so on. So lots and lots of other reasons um, that have nothing to do with salary that will have a big impact on whether or not you are successful long term in your career. Um, accepting counteroffers is never a good idea. It is uh, very oftentimes um, you are labeled in an organization uh, once you do that. Um, and it really is a uh, short-term fix for most people, uh, for most uh, organizations. You know, they, um, they're going to be in pain if you leave um, on the short run, so they'll do anything to get you to stay. But you know, after they're through that hump, I think it becomes very um, important. And you had something to add, right, Katie? Oh, right. Right, yes. And, and the, the problem with a candidate, um, uh, you know, Katie had mentioned that there was a candidate that, that, um, that she was working with who accepted the counteroffer and not even six months later called her back up and said, you know, I think I made a big mistake. And we hear that over and over again because the problems that they, you know, the reason they went on the market in the first place is they had concerns or some issues, and those don't go away. Um, so you need to, to keep that in mind um, because you know, the company will, because they don't want the short-term pain, um, they're going to you know, talk to you about all the wonderful things um, that they're going to give you, and um, it may or may not come true. So, Also, um, waiting too long to change jobs is another thing that you need to be careful of and that Katie touched on for early career. Um, change jobs when you can. Again, once you get to be a senior level person, the expectation is that you're going to bring, bring some expertise to the table. So that could be in industry knowledge or um, 
ability to manage or whatever else, or you know, technical skill. Um, but so you, your opportunity to change jobs comes in about the first 10 years of your career. After that, it becomes much more challenging. Don't become too title focused. Um, again, Katie went through that. Um, titles vary all over the place, and, and there are many situations where you may want to take a make a strategic move that have nothing to do with an increase in title. Uh, don't. Uh, it's very important also during the interviewing process to be very transparent with companies. So I think um, it's not. Um, it doesn't do you any good to hide things like other offers or other things that you're thinking about. These are people that you're going to potentially be working with um, day in and day out, and so you want to establish a sense of trust and a. Uh, you know, a foundation for a long-term positive relationship. So it's very important to stay transparent during the interviewing process with anybody that you're doing that you're uh, that you're uh, negotiating with. So um, okay, so you don't want your career to be a victim of disruption. Uh, not today. Not in 10 years. Not in 30 years. So what is it that you do to keep up? So let, I'm not going to spend tons of time on this because I think, again, we've talked about most of it. But um, make sure you – so this is just kind of a wrap-up review here. Um, keep your eye on the trends out there, what's going on, what's happening in terms of software and techniques and industries, et cetera, et cetera. Keep your eye on it. Um, second, network, network, network. And it's easy to do now with LinkedIn. Um, but it's, it's, and, and don't just network for the sake of networking because you need a new job. <laughs> um, make sure that you, are, that you stay in touch with people in a really friendly way and help them in situations if you can um, because it will pay off for you in the long term. So it's very, very important to do. Um, and then uh, finally, um, continuous learning. Absolutely critical nowadays. And what's great about it is it's so easy to do now and, 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 and so much easier than it used to be 20 years ago. So everything's available online. Uh, there's meetup groups, uh, there's uh, boot camps, there's MOOCs. Um, take advantage of that. Um, it all, I mean, easier said than done. It does take time to do this stuff, um, but it is well worth the investment in your career. So uh, that's what I have for the formal part of the talk. So Katie and I are um, – um, I'm going to uh, turn it back over to uh, Katie Prezis, and then we'll, Katie and I will stay around for a few minutes to answer any questions that you have. Take it away, Katie Prezis. Great. Thanks, Linda and Katie, um, for sharing all that helpful information. Um, for complete salary information for all career levels, uh, be sure to visit our website, www.birchworks.com. Um, for our full study of predictive analytics professionals. Um, more than 30 pages, and we'll be putting out an updated report in just a couple months for 2016. And also be sure uh, to visit our blog if you're interested in the results of our flash surveys, um, like our famed SAS versus R versus Python that just came out a couple weeks ago, plus other career advice for analytics professionals and data scientists. You can go to birchworks.com slash blog. If you missed anything from today's presentation or want to share it with a colleague, the recording will be made available on our YouTube channel very soon at youtube.com slash birchworks. You can also follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube to stay updated with our latest research flash surveys, career tips, and webinars. And our next webinar will be in just a few weeks in August. Um, we'll be sharing the results of our recent joint survey with Forrester uh, about customer analytics trends. So be sure to be on the lookout for the invitation to that. So now our favorite part of the session, Q&A. So I will dive right in here. Katie and Linda, um, definitely let us know your thoughts here. So first question, um, can you talk a little bit about uh, the value of a traditional master's degree on someone's resume versus the value of like a MOOC or a boot camp? How do companies value them? Do they view them the same way or differently? I would say um, that MOOCs and boot camps are sort of nice to have, and they're add-ons to a formal education. Um, it is difficult, as you know, most hiring managers will take a look at a, a master's degree much more seriously than than they would a, a boot camp that's a 12-week long um, uh, sort of crash course. 
So uh, it's important to lay that foundation in a formal way, um, but but you know there boot camps, boot camps and MOOCs are so valuable to sort of beef up your skills and as trends change to stay up with the with the trends. Perfect. Thank you, Linda. Um, what advice do you have for how to change industries if the person doesn't yet have relevant experience in that industry? I'll take this one, Linda. This is certainly can be on a case-by-case -case basis, but I would recommend um, if you want to change industries to maybe look at the full picture and maybe be open to taking a lateral move. Um, so maybe you can make the change, learn, grow, and then move up from there in that particular organization. I think you have to keep that in consideration when trying to make a change. Thanks, Katie. We received a couple questions about what is the optimal length of staying at a job um, when you're in the first 10 years of your career, and then what about later on in your career? So I'll start with the first 10. I would say you should probably change jobs two to three times in the first 10 years. I would, I would agree with that. And then after that, uh, I, I think it's important to really evaluate the situation and opportunistically make changes. I think if you're changing jobs every two years after that 10-year mark, uh, you're making a mistake that's too frequent because you know, you're in a leadership role and it's going to take longer than a couple of years to be able to uh, really see results of the work that you're responsible for. So um, at that point, I would say that you're talking, you should, you should Think about investing four to seven years uh, in each of the roles that you're in. Um, and again, as the more senior you get, probably the longer that tenure should be. Thank you both for that. Um, so someone asked, as they take the Iron Throne, so to speak, um, how do you handle other individuals who claim to do analytics but don't necessarily have the uh, strong skill set aren't necessarily native to analytics. How do you continue differentiating yourself um, as, a, as a true analytics professional from those folks? Oh, that's a, that's a really interesting question because, um, it, and you know, I don't know that I know um, the answer, and that's not a straightforward question, um, but I, you know, I will um, say that I think that that is a big problem right now because you know there's a lot of people out there, and, and you know I know a lot of the audience probably has MBAs, but let me just bash MBAs for just a second because I think that they <laughs> are um, just not you know they don't have the same uh, skill set um, that somebody with a quantitative degree does. Um, but you know, because analytics is all the rage, uh, they're making out like they do have it. So it's a really interesting time. And all I can say uh, is, again, you know, keep your skills fresh and, and show that. And you know, the cream always rises. So there you go. Thanks, Linda. Um, Katie, a question that probably you can speak to. Can you talk a little bit about what the market is like for entry-level analytics roles? Oh, gosh, good question. Um, certainly, many companies are hiring what I would consider entry level would be master's degree um, or PhD coming out of school. Um, sometimes bachelors with some experience you know, sneak in there, but just for argument's sake, master's degree with the, um, you know, coming right out of an analytics program or statistics program. Again, having internships will make your resume stand apart having coursework, whether it's a capstone or a project you did through, some, through a course with a real company with real data where you can explain from start to finish um, you know, what a project that you worked on will make your resume stand out for those entry level jobs that are out there. Um, you know, it's mixed. I would say I... You know, some companies will come and approach us for entry level candidates, and then unfortunately, some come and approach us because they want a very specific skill set. Um, and I 
think that um, you know of late because they, you know there's such a crunch to find people with experience to come in to staff these groups um, that the entry level market has been very strong. Mm -hmm. um, to counterbalance that, though, I know the academic programs are growing very very quickly, um, and so there are many many more entry level people now than there were even three or four years ago. So um, you know when is that? market going to be saturated, it's not there yet. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was saying about the resumes is you have to stand out because there are more and more people coming out of programs than ever um, and you have to have a company that's kind of willing to take a chance on you a little bit. So you need to stand out, have a good ba business acumen, you know, be curious, all the things that we talked about earlier today. Thank you. Um, Linda, this might be more in your wheelhouse. Um, someone asked, what strategies would you recommend if the responsibility in your current role has expanded pretty significantly, um, but you haven't experienced any change in compensation or title? It's really important uh, to communicate with your higher-ups in the organization. Um, and, and you know, you, you go and you talk about it. You present your case. You keep a dialogue going. Um, and again, you know, the, if you're a valued employee and you're being given added responsibilities and no increase in compensation, um, you know, there's just there's not a good excuse for that. And you know, a lot of companies that I work with are actually uh, going through compensation um, uh, changes now, so where they're changing the entire band. And you know, if back in the day, and I'm talking 25 years ago, not back in the day last year, um, a lot of companies um, uh, used to tie the analytic salary bands very closely to the IT salary bands, which is absolutely wrong. Um, and um, and so now, you know, they have, and a lot of them are using actually the Birchwork study in order to reevaluate where their compensation bands need to be. That's a discussion I have all the time uh, when I'm working on the senior level roles uh, where they're just creating a group. So, um, so it's important to just have that dialogue. And again, if if you don't get satisfaction, you know, your only recourse is to go out in the market because your market value is the offers that you pull, not what you imagine or not what you're necessarily being paid today, but the kind of offers you get out on the open market. Thanks, Linda. Um, okay, one last question. Um, if someone's goal is to eventually progress to a senior level manager sort of position, what are your thoughts about leaving a people management role to go into an individual contributor role uh, in order to get into a new company? What was the end of that, Katie? In order to get into a new company, what if they took an individual contributor role and stepped away yep. from people management for the time being? They were managing and then they decided to. Okay. Yeah, and again, that might be a good strategic move for somebody if they want to get out of a particular industry. Let's say they want to get out of pharmaceutical and they want to get into financial services or something like that, and they want to make a big change. Um, and if they're willing to do that and take an, uh, take an individual contributor role, um, it makes a lot of sense. And you're, n you're never going to lose that management experience. You have it on your resume. And it will show up, as, you know, even as an individual contributor. Um, if you have uh, sort of leadership traits, they're going to show in the way you present yourself, the way you work with other people, the way you interact during meetings, and the way you interact with senior level um, people in the organization. They'll see that. And again, and, uh, you know, does that mean you're going to get promoted in the next year? It depends. Maybe, but maybe not. So you really have to evaluate what that path is going to look like and what the t time frame might be for that for, you know, for you to uh, sort of increase your responsibility and take on additional management. I would also say that some companies don't let you manage people right away. They want you to come in and learn the business, get up to speed, and then, you know, bring that level of responsibility on. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't see it as a, you know, depend, again, yeah. every, every situation is different. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's certainly not a black mark if that's what, um, you know, the, the uh, person who asked the question was thinking. It's absolutely not a black mark. 
Perfect. Well, thank you both very much for all of your insights. That's all the time we have for today. Um, appreciate everyone joining us. If you have any other questions or you're looking to make your next strategic move, make sure you send us an email. You can go to candidates at birchworks.com um, and you'll be connected with the right person here on our team. Thanks very much everyone. Have a good day.